Thank you all for coming to this session. My name's Angela. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal. I'm Nithya. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal also. Um, and today we're going to be talking about debugging the routing tier. So the goal of the next 30 minutes or so together is that by the end of this presentation, everyone in the audience has a shared understanding of what the routing tier is and has some tools and tips in their bag now for debugging the routing tier and maybe even just debugging problems in general. In order to achieve this goal, um, our plan is to start by level setting on what exactly is the routing tier um, before looking at two actual case studies that me and Natia um, have debugged in relation two problems that manifested in the routing tier as members of the CF networking program. Um, and then we're going to cap it off with some additional general debugging tips that will hopefully allow you to see errors and get to the root cause. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Nitya to talk about what the routing tier is, if this clicker ever. Okay, well, that <laughs> works too. Yeah. Cool. So what is the routing tier and how does it fit into the rest of your Cloud Foundry? We want to give you a brief overview of what it is so that we can look at the case studies and debugging tips later. Uh, so if we look at this diagram here, the gray box represents all of the system components of CF, like your API, Diego, UAA, and your routers. And the components in the gray box are all the stuff that makes it possible for you to CF push and run your applications. And all the colorful components are the components of the routing tier. So in a typical CF deployment, your routing tier may consist of a load balancer, HA proxies, the routers, and your applications. So if we look at just the left side of this diagram, we can see all the components that an HTTP request might hit before being finally routed to an HTTP application. So the load balancer is the front-facing part of your CF, and it'll be the component that receives the request and will forward it onto the HA proxy. The HA proxy would be configured to point to the Go routers as its backends. You'd tend to use HA proxy in a deployment when you need features uh, offered by HA proxy that aren't offered by your load balancers or your CF routers. So for example, HA proxy allows you to define access control lists. So then you have GoRouter. GoRouter is a layer seven HTTP proxy router that handles uh, connections to the application backends. So it has a series of handlers that will run and process your request before it then makes a new request to the backend. It can also route you to other CF components like your API. And then ultimately, you reach your app. Cool, so now that you have an overview, um, we'll talk about problems that people have run into when running Cloud Foundry in production. So I'll give it over to Angela and we'll kick off the case studies. Great, oh, the clicker is working again, magical. Um, so again, we're going to dive into the first of two case studies. Um, these are actual problems that we have debugged as members of the networking program. And so hopefully we can share with you our methodology and how we approach debugging um, and offer some insight. Um, as these are real problems, they're definitely super interesting and we didn't do everything perfectly, but hopefully following along the path that we did offers insight into how you might debug in the future. So oftentimes when problems are manifesting in the routing tier, that means that there's a problem with your data path. In production, this means that your production apps might no longer be reachable. So it's pretty easy as a person, as a customer, um, a user of Cloud Foundry, when you run into this, to say that the problem is simply that the Go router is broken. Um, your production system is failing, you should be panicking. But to be on the receiving end of this information, it's not exactly the most helpful in debugging what the actual problem is. If you're the one who's actively debugging the issue um, and run into it yourself, or if somebody else is providing you this information, even if 
it's presented to you instead of the Go router is broken, but in a very detailed form and a very clear explanation, the first thing we always like to state to do is to state the problem in your own words. This allows you to make sure that you have the same shared common understanding as whoever is reporting the issue to you. Or if you're the one who's discovered the issue, stating the problem in your own words gives you this baseline understanding to then share with others and provide sort of the basis of what you're trying to find the root cause of. So for case study number one, the problem that we faced was that the customer had two microservices deployed. One was an externally facing front end application that would send CRUD requests to the second back end application. The microservice on the front end would send a GET followed immediately by a PUT request. The GET request would always succeed, but the PUT would always error. I realize that this is a wall of text, so let's visualize what this problem statement is saying. In this case, we see that there's an incoming GET request from an external client. The Go router forwards this request to the front end, which will then make a GET request to the back end. The GET request will actually, in this case, hairpin back out through the Go router um, and go to the back end, and this succeeds. So the information gets passed back along. And then the front end makes the immediate <coughs> follow up of a PUT request. And then what happens? We know an error is occurring, but what we don't know is, is the problem happening at the Go router? Or is the put request successfully going through the Go router to the back end and then erroring out? Who really knows? <laughs> That's why we're here to debug the problem. This is further complicated by the fact that while we've been looking at the Go router front end and back end as the only components in this system, they're only a part of our Cloud Foundry topology. We also have to contend with other parts of the routing tier, as Nithya described earlier, such as the HE proxy and load balancer. So instead of there being only four network connections, we have to consider up to eight, if not more. And that's a lot more places where the error could actually be occurring. So the second thing that we want to do um, in terms of debugging is the level set on the architecture. How exactly is the routing tier set up? In this case, it was set up pretty straightforward, a very typical CF routing topology with a load balancer, HA proxy, Go router, and then applications. And so you might say, great, we know the problem, we know the components. It's easy to want to jump in, jump the gun, and try and figure out the connection that's failing, but Let's stay in the information collection phase. And in addition to gathering and level setting on the architecture, also gather information about the configuration for each of these components as well. By gathering all of this information up front, it allows us access to more knowledge and information so that in the future, if we think a problem might be happening for one component or another, we don't have to go back and collect information again. So the configuration that you'd want to gather would be information about the load balancers, HA proxy, Go router, and usually involves including inf gathering information about a whole slew of different timeouts. After you gather configuration, the third thing we want to do, and this might not be the most helpful thing to say, is gather even more information. <laughs> Um, I realize that this is pretty broad, right? Like before we were being a little bit more narrow by saying we want to learn the architecture, we want to gather configuration, but what is this quote unquote more information, right? Um, it really depends on what the problem statement is and what issue you're trying to debug. But this additional information generally includes things like application logs, which in this case was what alerted us to this problem in the first place seeing an IO error on the put request, uh, but can include other logs as well. So you can gather logs from the load balancer if possible, the HA proxy, and Go router, in addition to your applications. In this situation as well, given that we know that a network connection is failing somewhere, the other set of information that we want to gather is what's, what's actually happening with our network connections. And so this is where the first tool that we're going to talk about today comes into play, which is TCP dump. So 
what is TCP dump? Um, TCP dump is a packet analyzer that you can use via the command line. Um, there's no GUI for it, um, but what you can do with it often is use it to capture information on a remote server, write the output to a file, and then actually visualize and understand that file with some other packet analyzer that has a GUI. Um, so in this case, we ran TCP dump on every single VM involved in the connection path that we had access to. So we ran TCP dump on the Diego cell, which our applications were running on, on the HA proxy, and on the Go routers. Um, we did so via you know, a very simple command, TCP dump, write the output to this out.pcap file, and then listen on the ETH0 interface. So looking for all network packets coming in and out of that virtual machine. Doing so, we now had all of the information about the network connections that were occurring. But again, it can be sort of hard to discern what network traffic was actually happening by looking at the file itself. And so this is where the second tool we're going to talk about comes into play. I'm sorry, we're really, is this a clarifying question or? Just later on. Okay. Um, and so this is where we come to Wireshark. Um, so Wireshark is an open source packet analyzer with a GUI. Um, so you can use Wireshark to um, look at network traffic in real time, or you can load a packet, or you can load a file into it to analyze. And so this is what we typically tend to do is use TCP dump to actually gather information about packets, load it into a file, and then load that file into Wireshark to then understand what's going on. Um, Wireshark is also nice because in addition to providing visualizations, it also allows you to filter and inspect packets. So you can ignore any packets that might not be relevant to the network connection that you currently want to be viewing. Um, so in this case, we'll look at an example of a Wireshark um, in use. So here we can see um, that this is how we can visualize in Wireshark. We have information including the timestamp. We have the source and destination IP for the packet. We have the um, type of connection. We have um, the content length. And then at the very end, additional information about your packet. Um, so in this case, we had filtered on a specific connection between the Diego cell, where the front end was living, and the HA proxy. And what was interesting in this was that we saw that the HA proxy was actually sending a fin act packet to the Diego cell. So what the HA proxy is saying by sending a fin act packet is that I want to close this connection. I no longer will be respectful to this network connection. But immediately after this FINAC packet was sent from the HA proxy to the Diego cell, the Diego cell was sending a whole slew of new packets. And this is what was causing our put to error out. So at this point in time, as we're actively debugging, the customer is probably also trying a whole slew of different things to try and get their system to stop failing, right? And so we get this new information that disabling keep alives from the Go router to the back end fixes the issue, which is weird because <laughs> disabling keep alives from the Go router to back end is the red arrows right here. But we had seen that the connection was failing between the front end and HA proxy, connection number five. What is going on? How can keep alive these red arrows impact what's happening with connection five here? Well, at this point, we had gathered all the information that we thought was necessary. And so the next step in our debugging process is to come up with a hypothesis and a plan of attack. So honestly, we were pretty biased by this recent information that had fixed the problem. And so our initial hypothesis was that some value was being propagated from the Go router that makes the connection between the HA proxy and front end fail, right? Like if the Go router, like having keep alive enabled fixes the issue, then maybe some values being propagated that would cause it to occur. That is again, some values being propagated from the red arrows here 
that would impact connection five. But while we were able to come up with this hypothesis, we couldn't come up with a plan of attack to either prove or disprove that this hypothesis was true. And so because we couldn't do that, looking back at all the information we had collected via TCP dump and Wireshark, we decided to discard that hypothesis for now and come up with a new one. And this is sort of in line with our general process of repeating coming up with a hypothesis and plan of attack until the root cause is found. So really trying to zero in on the information we had at hand, our second hypothesis was that something about the HTTP client is causing the closed packet to be ignored. And after we came up with this hypothesis, we got another interesting tidbit from the customer. That if we wait five seconds between making the get request from the front end to back end, and then the put request, it would always succeed. Five seconds. Sounds sort of like some timeout. It fit pretty in line with thinking about the HTTP client and its configuration. So we asked to see the application source code to know how the front end application was actually making its request. Doing so, we saw that in the application itself, which was a Spring application, it was simply calling http.get. It was using the default HTTP client, no overrides. So luckily at Pivotal, we have lots of Spring experts. So we went to Slack, went to Google and Stack Overflow. And what we learned is the default HTTP client in Spring does not respect closed packets. It will try to reuse the existing connection. And furthermore, the default timeout for the HTTP client is five seconds. So after five seconds, the HTTP client would close the connection, open a new one. And so that's why if you waited five seconds, you'd always see it succeed. This is also confirmed by looking at the configuration that we had gathered about the HA proxy previously, in which we saw that the keep alive timeout was set to half a second. So after half a second, the HA proxy was closing the connection, but our client simply wouldn't respect it. Salt. Obviously, this took a lot longer to debug than the 10 minutes I'm describing up here. But we can take away some valuable lessons from this. First of all, clients have configuration too. Um, so when we're looking at the configuration to gather, in addition to looking at the system components, you should also gather information about any HTTP clients if they're in the data path. We also learned to ignore the red herrings and short-term fixes. In this example, Keep Alive's led us astray at first to form an incorrect first hypothesis that we couldn't actually prove or disprove. Um, only after we found the root cause were we then able to go back and say, why exactly would Keep Alive fix the issue? Which was a whole nother debugging session in and of itself. Given that we only have 10 or so minutes left, we're not going to go into that. And instead, I'm going to hand it over to Nitya to talk about case study number two. Cool. Thanks, Angela. Um, all right, so let's look at this one. So the problem statement here is that the API becomes responsive, unresponsive when trying to CF login. Other requests succeed, and some of the Go router instances have high memory usage. So first, let's visualize this. Even though we were told that the Go router has high memory usage, let's remember that there are several components that the CF login request needs to go through. In this case, here's a diagram of what this deployment architecture looks like. Requests travel into the load balancer through one of the HA proxy instances into one of the Go router instances, and then it finally reaches the API. And then the response needs to go back through all of these components. So now we can start to gather some information. Um, here's a couple of places that you can look. Uh, they're roughly ordered from broad to more focused. And as you move from top to bottom, you may find some indicators that let you skip stuff that's irrelevant. But right now, the only information we have relates to high memory usage. So let's start broad and look at the VM vitals. So here's a snippet of some of the VM vitals. <coughs> 
you can get all of this information from Bosch and it can tell you about the health of the VMs. So this snippet happens to be only from router instance zero and it's one of the VMs that was experiencing the problem in the problem statement. Oh, the boxes are off, but you can kind of tell which columns they're supposed to be on. Uh, so you can observe here that the memory usage on router zero was pretty high, but that the CPU usage is actually fairly low. And another interesting observation is that the memory being swapped is also increasing over time uh, on this router. So based on what we've kind of seen so far, a reasonable hypothesis could be that Go router isn't scaled enough and there aren't enough instances to handle the load. But we've also learned from looking around on the VMs that even though we see these symptoms on router instance zero, this wasn't actually happening on all of the router instances, just a few of them. And in fact, after restarting the routers with the high memory usage, the problem would return often on another router VM. So the routers that did experience these symptoms still reported that they were healthy, and so there was actually no indication to the load balancer to direct traffic elsewhere. So, so far there's a couple of things that are telling us that horizontally scaling the Go router isn't actually going to help. So the CPU usage was low, and a majority of the CPU time was spent waiting. Also, the load balancer health check requests themselves uh, are just fine, so only some requests are unresponsive. So adding more Go router instances won't help since traffic won't be directed away from them anyway, the bad ones. So now we should try to zoom in further, uh, look at the logs and see if there's anything useful there. So here's a snippet of the Go router error logs. Uh, one error sticks out here. The Go router is having trouble with connections to other components because it was hitting the maximum number of open files. So now we have something to start digging into. Why are we hitting these limits? Are the limits themselves too low? Or which connections, incoming or outgoing, are causing us to hit this limit? So let's look at the diagram again. Um, open files to the Go router could be caused by any one of these red arrows. Uh, so it could be AJ proxy to the Go router, Go router to app backends, or Go router to system components. Um, there's actually one more place that we could have open files on the Go router. So if you have a route service, as part of handling the request that the Go router gets from HA proxy, uh, Go router will also send a request to the route service and keep that connection open while, uh, while the route service is still doing its processing. So connections from HA proxy to Go router will stay open while the route service is still processing its request. So now we want to zoom into these red arrows where we can to gather some more information. And we actually learned that the number of connections between HA proxy and the Go router are going, growing but not go router to the back ends. So that's really helpful. We know that it's this highlighted arrow that's growing, and we can start to reason about why that might be. So connections from HA proxy to the go router stay open for as long as go router is processing that request, uh, including if it's processing it in a route service. So a slower misbehaving route service could cause connections from HA proxy to Go router to stay open. So that could be an arrow, a reason why this circled arrow is growing. So given what we know so far, a misbehaving route service could be a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, but we ended up ruling it out by killing route services that were slow and seeing the problem persist. And if you recall from before, it did only seem like some type of requests were experiencing the bottleneck since the load balancer health checks were still okay, and we've ruled out route services, and we need more information about requests going into the Go router, so the Go router's access logs can give us that. And what we learned from the access logs was that there are many 404s, but also that the request time for the 404s is much higher than for other response codes. 
So our new hypothesis is that 404s are causing the connections to stay alive. And we have a lot of outside information at this point, but our observations seem to be a symptom of a deeper problem. So what we really need to do is dig into the 404s and see how GoRouter itself is dealing with them. Um, to help us do this, we can profile the code. So a good tool for doing that is pprof. pprof allows you to collect and visualize CPU profiles, traces, heap profiles, Go routine profiles, et cetera, all these things to profile a Go program. GoRouter has a pprof endpoint uh, for collecting profile and trace data. And flame, graph, flame graphs are a way to visualize profile data uh, that contains stack traces. So we'll look at a flame graph of profile data of the Go router while the problem's occurring. So here's this flame graph of the CPU profile. You can't read the text, but we'll talk about that in a sec. First, uh, let's see how to read the flame graph. So the text in all of these boxes are function names. When you use CPU profiling, the profiler interrupts the program's execution at specified intervals and logs the state of the program's call stack. The length of the boxes tells you how many samples during the profile were spent in this function while the function is executing. So I very, very roughly think of this as time spent in this function. So generally, you'd want to look at the wider boxes and the last couple of calls in the stack, which are towards the bottom. So there's a lot of samples in this stack. It's a lot of time. Uh, and the interesting thing about this stack is that it's the stack that calls out to the logger. So there's some kind of bottleneck in logging. And we know that when profiling this code, there were a lot of 404s, and the 404s likely resulted in logging. And further down the stack, we see that during the write for the log, it's calling to a locking function. So we finally found our bottleneck, which is lock contention when writing to the disk. So lock contention when writing to the disk could be caused by any combo of many writes to the disk and an actual slow disk. And the router does attempt to log route unknown for all 404s, which we know is happening very frequently in this case when the problem was manifesting. So this could be what causes the connections to persist because they were stuck waiting to write. And this was verified by isolating the Go router on a VM on an empty hypervisor with no other VMs and seeing the problem go away because there was no more storage contention. So yay. So here's what we can take away from this case. There were a lot of VM metrics we looked at at the beginning, but none really had to do with the disk. So maybe if we had looked at something like IOSTAT earlier, uh, that could have geared us in the right direction a little earlier. And also it's kind of useful to start broad and gather as much information as you can and kind of zoom in uh, because it gives you more context for when you look at data from things like pprof. If you just kind of look at a flame graph straight off the bat, you're not really sure what you're looking for. So, yeah. Great. So, now let's go into some general debugging tips in the last couple of minutes we have together. So, the first thing we always like to recommend is to check your timeout configurations. So, in general, you want your load balancer to have the highest timeouts, then your Go router, and then your application. This is because you don't want something higher up in your routing tier to be prematurely closing the connection, while something further on may still be able to serve it. Additionally, in regards to logging, we want to note that application logs have timestamps, and so you can look at what's happening at the application um, level and try to map those logs to what's happening in the Go router or HA proxy logs as well. Um, additionally, endpoint failure requests in the access logs have a corresponding log in the Go router. Um, and so you can correlate the two using the VCAP request ID header. Lastly, some other tips we have is if you are in doubt and you're able to, you should pull the load balancer out of the equation. It just removes one more component that could be causing the problem. Um, also, testing each router individually depending on the problem statement 
might be good as well. Um, and lastly, we always recommend checking the certs on each level, as certificate management and generation can definitely be a challenge. So we're gonna post all these slides on the schedule. If you're interested in digging deeper into any of these tools, we have references to all of them listed here. Otherwise, I'm sorry, um, we're happy to answer questions outside the door because I think there's another talk scheduled after and we're at time, but thank you so much um, and have a great rest of your summit. <laughs>